question is, do we pick our uh, life script and our parents and all that? The question is, which we are you talking about? Who you think you are didn't. Who you are did. Who you are picked who you think you are. When you awaken from who you think you are, then you will know who chose. The only pious and the, the you who you think you are has no free will. You're being had. You are just lawful stuff unfolding. Who you are is free. Welcome to another Ram Dass Here and Now podcast. I'm Jackie Dabrinska, Director of Education and Community Outreach for Love Serve Remember Foundation. You all, you are the Ram Dass community, the Ram Dass Satsang, whether this is your first episode or your 207th. So this is not part two, as we said last time. We just like to keep you on your toes a little bit. Today, instead, our talk is going into some deep territory. He talks about suicide and abortion and the art of navigating evil. So it's some real life stuff. It's the stuff of our suffering, which is something none of us get to bypass or do a runaround with, even with our pretty and neat theories. We, we have to navigate this, these hard territories. And so it's a great talk to listen to. And I'm really curious how it lands for each and every one of you. If you're interested in diving deeper with others around this talk or those in the future, make sure you join the Ram Das Fellowship virtual meetups. The next one is Tuesday, September 13th at 3 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's a Zoom call. It's free. Everyone's welcome. We just get together and chat about what came out. We share our curiosities and our inspirations and a lot of other things. So to sign up, you just go to ramdas.org slash fellowship, and then you'll get the invitations through that. Listening to this talk, I was reminded of that quote by author and minister Ian McLaren. The quote is often misattributed to Plato, but it says, be kind for everyone you meet is fighting a hard battle. Kindness matters. No matter what someone looks or acts like on the outside, kindness matters. In fact, the New York Times recently did a report a new research that highlights how these small gestures, these small acts of random kindness can change people's lives and in fact, even save them. So kindness is an actual and complete practice and it involves mindfulness and love and compassion and action. And why am I going on about kindness? Mostly because our world needs it but also because Love, Serve, Remember Foundation is offering a course on the foundations of kindness on September 20th. Of all the courses I've put together, this is my favorite. It's a lot of archival recordings from Ram Dass, both pre and post stroke. It includes Sharon Salzberg and Jack Kornfield and Joseph Goldstein and Roshi Joan Halifax. And it's just really poignant and compact. Uh, it also has some weekly live components. So it's a month long. It's available with sliding scale. No one turned away for lack of funds. So if you want some more kindness in your life, check it out, ramdas.org slash kindness. And just so you can find your and weave your way into the various things that are going on in this community, we also want you to know about the book that was just released. It's a boatload more kindness coming from Maharaji that was experienced by folks after he left his body. Uh, you can It's called Whisper in the Heart, and you can find it on shop.ramdas.org. And one last piece of news before jumping in. This podcast, this network, it's six years old, and we could not do this without your support. There's a whole team of people that work to put these podcasts together. We are in the midst of our annual fundraising drive, but we want these intros to be short. So I'll just simply encourage you to donate so we can keep doing this now and into the future. And when you do donate, not only do you get to keep 20 plus podcasts rolling, but you also 
are entered to win perhaps a uh, spot at the Maui retreat in December or some really cool swag, including an Alan Watts and Ram Dass t-shirt and poster. So donate at beherenownetwork.com slash fundraiser. Thanks for your time and attention as we share the many ways that you can weave in to this community and into this legacy. So now we'll jump into the podcast after a 60 second word from our sponsor. Namaste. Yeah. There is a, um, the typhoid Mary example, uh, is, um, could you have foreseen that? Could you foresee that? Um, there is a place of consciousness where everything is known, past, present, and future. In order to be part of that, you have to cease being who you are. So who you are will never know everything, but everything is known. So it is conceivable that you could be, by dying into it, that ultimate wisdom that knows why everything is the way it is and what would happen. Those beings that are that way, the interesting question is, why don't they change everything since they could? Since they understand the way in which thought creates form and they would be free as Christ's statement, hedgy but faith, you could move mountains. But once you are connected enough to the universe to have that level of faith, you are the mountain and you know why you're there in the first place. So the interesting thing is that the more conscious people get, the less they try to screw around with the game. Because the more they understand why it is the way they, the way it is, including their protests and all that, but they don't do it from getting identified with thinking they're changing things. They're just doing what they do, whether it's lie down on the railroad track or do whatever they do. Is that dealing with your question? Yeah. Talking about suicide, perhaps around the imminent uh, death from suffering with AIDS. Um, my guru used to say to me, when I'd be upset about things in the world, he'd say, Ram, Ram Dass, don't you see it's all perfect? And I'd say, perfect, Maharaji? Starvation, hunger, all that. And he would cry about those things and say to me, yes, but don't you see it's perfect? Like, and don't you see it's perfect? Don't you see the plane at which everything is unfolding lawfully and there are no errors in the game and nobody leaves one incarnation a minute before the appropriate moment nor a minute too late. We are obsessed with how people leave the stage when it's time to leave the stage, you leave the stage. No matter what you think in your mind is the reason behind the leaving of the stage. The act of suicide is an attachment. It's usually, in most cases, it is either an act of pushing away life or grabbing a death. The art is to die with your consciousness absolutely clear, neither pushing nor pulling. Most of us in this room will not die that way. That's why we will continue on the wheel of birth and death. People that commit suicide a moment after they have done that are aware of their predicament. And they are aware that that attachment projected them into the next moment, which determines what happens next. It's not punishment. It is just the unfolding of cause and effect of creation of the code dependent arising everything's related to everything else now what i say to somebody when they talk to me about suicide is you have to decide how much suffering you can convert if you can take your suffering and grow through it fine to just suffer isn't necessary you're not going to be better for it so you make the decision when you die. It's perfectly fine for you to make your decision. 
But I also say to the person, if you're asking me, I would say, use as much of your life experience as you can because it's a precious birth and very useful. So use your suffering, use all of the losses, all of it. It's all vehicles for awakening. Okay? Is that dealing with it? Yes. About immortality. What do you mean by immortality? Uh, yeah, you can arrive at the level of consciousness where you are identified, you're so, you're, you're so far back that you are aware of the law that brings about the end of that karmic form, and you are part of that which is, you could say, choosing it or allowing it or whatever, okay? And there are beings that take incarnation that way. That are, I mean, there are beings that take intentional incarnation that are never, like a Krishna or a Christ, they don't go to sleep and then wake up like we do. They just drop down to help us along or bless us or whatever. There's what? Oh, the, you're talking about people keeping their body or growing, yeah. All those powers, those are called siddhis or powers, and they're possible. The, the clearer you are, the more these siddhis come along the way, and you can rejuvenate yourself and stay alive. The question is, why would you do it? I mean, it's like staying back in the fourth grade. Why would you do it? I mean, you might as well go on to the fifth grade. You might do it out of compassion for someone else. That would be a nice thing. But you'd only do it out of the bodhisattva vow. The whole thing about powers is you don't use them. The art is not using them. And uh, as they said about my guru, they said he moved around when he was young. When he was old, he slowed down. And then when it was time, he died. And it's nothing special. And yet he had all those powers. So, uh, I mean, my friend Tim has already made a deal with to have his brain frozen so... Later, I said, what body are you going to come back in, Tim? Imagine this 19-year-old girl with your brain. My <laughs> God. I, I, <laughs> thought is appalling. Yes, sir. Um, the relationship to a personal God is... Um, a way that is easy for a human incarnate to start from. Because you, you know relationship and you know that kind of emotional heart quality of relationship. So to, to anthropomorphize the thing, to project a being and then relate to it, it's like having an imaginary playmate. And you make the imaginary playmate you, you know, you really invest the imaginary playmate. The bizarre thing that happens at the end is, as I've said before, you find out that the imaginary playmate was real and you were imaginary. But that's the... <laughs> see, because you finally merge into God and then you as a separate entity are kind of irrelevant. So, but at first it's your projection outward from your human thing. Now, ultimately... The merging into the one, once you're in the one, there's no one, there's no two, so one is equal to zero at that point. Then you could say God is nirvana. God is formless. And all the names of the formless are merely names that we use in order to have a doorway through. Because you love the separate entity until you merge into it, and then the, the dualism disappears. So it's a technique. It's a form. It's a vehicle. Right? But to think about somebody there that's doing it to you is paranoia. See? Because you can say somebody is there and you can relate to, and somebody is there who understands the unfolding of your karma. And ultimately you understand that who is there is you. And that you are your own guru or you are your own god or whatever. That's the ultimate merging. That's when... But see, in, in bhakti or dualism, like when you love Christ or you love Krishna, a real devotee, or love Ram or Hanuman, the real devotee doesn't want to merge. They want, it's like, it's like foreplay. They don't want to have orgasm. 
Because in the orgasm, that's the end of your separateness. And they want to hang back in order to enjoy the beloved. So they push against the merging in order to stay separate, in order to stay just a whisper away from God. And those real bhakti devotional yogis like uh, Rumi and Kabir and Hafiz and all those people, they're always just one breath away from merging. Okay? Sir. Question is, do we pick our uh, life script and our parents and all that? The question is, which we are you talking about? Who you think you are didn't. Who you are did. Who you are picked who you think you are. When you awaken from who you think you are, then you will know who chose. The only person... The... The... You, who you think you are, has no free will. You're being had. You are just lawful stuff unfolding. Who you are is free. Okay. So you're dealing with that paradox. So die. <laughs> out, out, brief candle. Questions? Yes. The issue of abortion from a spiritual perspective. As I said in answer to the suicide question, there are no errors in the game. I was with um, uh, that Trungpa Rinpoche again once, and he was talking about abortion, and he said, don't you understand that it's the, it's the conspiracy of three souls that that happens? That it's not like one person decides to do it to another person. All those decisions are coming out of much deeper stuff in all the beings involved, including the fetus. And in some cases, it is a violent act that creates suffering. In others, it is a compassionate act. And there are no rules other than the trust to your intuitive heart as to what you do. You listen very carefully. It's everybody involved. Maybe that being needed only whatever they needed out of fetal period. That's all they needed from that incarnation. You have had so many incarnations. Remember the image. Buddha says, imagine a mountain six miles long, six miles wide, six miles high, and every hundred years, a bird flies over the mountain with a silk scarf in its beak and runs the scarf over the mountain once, every hundred years. In the length of time it would take the scarf to wear away the mountain. That's how long you've been doing this. You see? So, give or take, you know, it's... We're like those bugs that are born in the morning and die in the evening. And around we noon, we say, that's life, you know? I mean, it's just bizarre. It's bizarre. It's just flicks of consciousness. We've died every single way. You and I have been aborted thousands of times, probably. You know, we've been our own mothers. Uh, it's, yeah, yeah. I mean, everybody's related. It's just so absurd. <laughs> Sir, to playing the game impeccably without contradiction. What do you mean by that? Yeah, um, in the Bhagavad Gita, which is the book of instructions about this particular form, it says two things. Do what you do, because it's what you do, but do it without identification with being the actor, and do it without attachment to the fruits of the action. But you do it because it's your part to play. I am here doing this, because this is what I do. I'm not doing it. If you were to see me as your, it depends on which eyes you're looking at. If you look at one level, you are seeing somebody up here talking. If you are looking at me at another level, we're just sitting here together in silence in which there is talking and there is listening. Right? So to the extent that I am just sitting here, it says, he does nothing and nothing is left undone. Therefore, there's no identification with the actor. 
You say, Hakuin says, your coming and going is nowhere but where you are. You're always right here. And the other one is be not attached to the fruits of the action. What happens to your consciousness as a result of my doing this is your karmic predicament. If I'm attached to how you come out, then I'm going to suffer. And I'm going to manipulate. I'm going to do all kinds of things. I do this because I do this. You're here because you're here. What happens is what happens. This is where impeccability lies. As Don Juan says, you huff and you puff and you make believe it makes a difference. <laughs> and that's known as controlled folly. And that's why life gets so light, even the heavy parts. Because you're just dancing, you're dancing your part. And so you're an impeccable father, an impeccable mother. And you're an impeccable protester, or an impeccable judge. Whatever you do, you do it cleanly and impeccably. You may be, I mean, you, each thing, as, and as you hear more and more, as your wisdom gets deeper, your actions get more harmonious with more and more of the forces because the quiet mind hears more and more of all the forces at play. The more agitated the mind, the more you only hear the thing right at your, right there. And to be here now means to be here now in the fullness of here. Okay. Sir. Um, as you, um, as you go on the journey, uh, you realize, as I said, that you want to be free. And then you go to the places that you can work with that are the hottest fire for you, but that you can transmute. Relationship is one of those. I mean, you can stay high alone. It's much higher to stay high in an intimate relationship with another human being because everybody gets frightened and they all put up, you know, they, they start to protect themselves. And then the minute they do that, it's just roles interacting and the spirit is gone way down in and it gets lost. So it's a beautiful yoga. It is a hard yoga. But the predicament is if you push anything away, it's got you. I mean, like renunciate path is interesting, but what you end up with usually are horny celibates, <laughs> you know? And that's not interesting enough. I mean, I tried it. It's just not interesting. Enough. Yeah. I'd rather eat it all alive. I'd rather eat suffering and pleasure and sex and everything and just keep consuming it into myself because I, my faith is so strong that I... I want truth and I want living spirit. And anything else is just so yick, why bother? I mean, lust is just not interesting enough, you know, and it used to be for years. <laughs> Come up and see my holy pictures. <laughs> the one behind you and I'll come to you. Yeah, you, yeah, go ahead. Do I desire to do what I'm doing? I would say I neither desire to do it nor desire not to do it. I would say it's in the way of things. I am, I, this is the thing I do. If I'm quiet enough, this is the thing I'm doing. I'm here partly because of you. I'm playing my part. It's, it's just like your part. We're just playing our parts. I don't have to milk it, you know. Look at me doing this, you know. <laughs> They're all watching me. You know, that, that is so empty, it isn't worth it. I'll tell you, that and 50 cents gets you, you know, a Coke. Huh? Do I enjoy it? Yeah. Yeah, I enjoy it. I feel it's very graceful. And I'm quite happy and I'm quite content, so I guess I enjoy it. You know? That's fair enough, yeah. Oh, no, yes. If everything is perfect, how do we deal with the Holocaust? How do we deal with evil? Um, when you go back in consciousness behind, you go back, you go back from the many, and then you get into the nine, seven, five, four, three, two. You get back into two, the realm of two, which is dark and light, 
positive, negative, love and hate, um, good and evil, all of these things. And then you see that right behind that is the one. And the one includes the two. Like G. Manley Hall said, one who knows not that the prince of darkness is but the other face of the king of light knows not me. So that. So as your consciousness starts to rest in the one, if you push away the two, you're still off balance because for an enlightened being, there's no way to stand. To stand in the two with the awareness of the one means that you become an instrument of good against evil. But you don't do it as an entrapment in the polarity. So you don't hate evil. You understand that your job is to act against evil. And you identify evil as a set of actions that are the result of karma of individuals. So you don't blame people, you blame acts. You stop acts and you punish acts, but you don't punish people. And that's a very interesting one. That's the art form of, of being able to resist evil and do it from a place of dispassion. But that's your function. That's what you do. And as you understand more and more what part it is, see, it's very interesting. I was with a uh, Benedictine uh, abbot once, and he said to me, he took me and was studying, closed the door. He said, I have only question, one question to you. What was the meaning of the kiss between Jesus and Judas? I said, it's possible that they both understood the game. And that was an act of compassion on both of their parts to play it out. Right? And yet it was the act of one to do the other, etc., etc. Can you hear that one? And that is hard. It pushes us right to the limit because we can't get off on the bad guys and we're the good guys. You've got to realize that in each of us is all of it. You know, in each of us is all of it. If it, does prayer work? And if so, how does it work? Prayer, to pray to somebody, is, has you thinking about somebody, and it opens you to that dimension of reality. As you understand more and more, it's interesting what you'd actually pray for. You wouldn't actually pray for things to change. The only thing I can think to pray for is understanding, is having the wisdom to understand the way it is so that my actions will come out of that harmony, that deepest understanding. The question is, can your mind change things in the universe? And the answer is yes, certainly it can. But be careful what you do with it, because you don't even know why it's the way it is before you... Like people would say to Ramana Maharshi, you know, what's going to happen in the world politically, and, and can't you change it? And he says, Wait until you understand why it is the way it is. You know, you don't even know who you are. What are you so busy changing everything for? Yeah. Sir. <laughs> Does this thing ever end? It never began. <laughs> I'll tell you, if you think it never ends, it never ends. If you think it never began, it never began. If you think it, it. <laughs> it's, it's where you are in relation to time. Like eternal damnation as long as you think you're damned. Oh my God, I'm eternally damned. Well, that was an interesting trip. <laughs> Now what will I do till dinner? <laughs> Sir. How would society deal with people who murder, rape, and steal? Well, I think that we would do our best to prevent those actions. And I think we would do our best to create those actions in a way that doesn't create more suffering in the doing of it. I think that there are people that cannot 
because of the nature of their karma that are not able to be free in a social system because they take away other people's freedom and they create suffering. But I think you contain them not with anger in your heart and not with retribution, but just because that's what has to be done. Because a society is a collaboration for the common good. And if a person can't live in a society and yet is part of it, then they have to be segregated. To segregate somebody and re-educate them and open them as far as you can is the optimum thing to do, I would think. I don't see that retribution is what the issue is. I don't blame somebody. I'm, I, I, like there's a fellow that I write to in prison that's a, a pederast and he picks up young boys and he gets out of prison and he's doing fine and he gets rehabilitated and his wife and takes him back and he's doing fine and then he just gets this incredible compulsion to find a boy and he never does violence to him but he finds a young boy and he, he plays with his genitalia. And then he gets caught and then he gets, and the judge like, no, we're going to get you. This is the third time this has happened. We're going to put you away for life. And uh, he's in a system in which he is treated as if he is an evil human being. And really what he is, is a sick human being. He's a person whose desire systems, whose addictions are different than the cultural norm. Let's put it that way. As everybody else is addicted in ways that everybody agrees, that's okay to be addicted that way. Okay. And that's what your situation is, you know? And uh, he's got to understand that that's what he's caught in and use it for his own growth since he's in it. So it's, it's a heavy curriculum. It's like, you know, suffering 201. <laughs> How do you relate population growth with incarnation? There are so many more beings than are incarnated on this rather trivial plane that there are plenty around all the time. The ones that take birth on this plane are the ones who have the predispositions that make the kind of sandpaper this plane offers optimum. So if there are more of them at any time, it is just in the way of things because there are so many more than ever take birth. It's not like you just keep taking birth on one plane. There are many places, there are an infinite number of varieties to take birth on. The funny thing is where you think you're going is where you'll go. There was a great guy, there was a guy named Arthur Ford who was a psychic and he described what the other side was like and then he died, and then he sent a book, he channeled a book through Ruth Montgomery, and it described just what he thought was going to happen, which was, he's at school, and they're working hard, and I, I thought, oh, geez, I don't want to go there, you know. <laughs> this podcast is brought to you by the Love Serve Remember Foundation and Ramdas.org. We appreciate you listening, and we appreciate all the support that you've given us. Please continue that support and donate at ramdas.org. We can then continue to share what Ramdas has been sharing for all of these years. Thank you.